And then let me share the screen. Ugh, difficulties with my new mouse. Hold on, doesn't want to behave. Come on, there we go. Okay, get rid of the PowerPoint. Okay, up here. Okay, so we are actually on lesson 11. Um, and we're going to look at the gentleman who is hardly known by this name, but he is St. John of Antioch. And wow, really having, um, I need to do a personal reflection first. I was first introduced to this preacher, presbyter, deacon, bishop, apologist back in, well, let me think the year, 1996. This was the quote that I needed to hear at the time because my dad had suddenly died of a heart attack and I fell into depression. My dad was my spiritual mentor. Uh, he's the one who's always handing me books to read. Um, and we would talk for hours into the wee hours of the morning. Anyway, um, about a year and a half after he passed away, um, my pastor at the time gave me a sermon by this man. And this is the part that kind of began the straightening out of my head and heart. And it uh, was a letter slash sermon written to a woman who'd lost her husband. And it said, certainly if he had altogether perished and utterly ceased to be, it would be right to be distressed and sorrowful. But if he has only sailed into the tranquil haven and taken his journey to him who is really his king, one ought not to mourn but to rejoice on these accounts. For this death is not death, but is only, but only a kind of emigration and translation from the worse to the better, from earth to heaven, from men to angels and archangels, and him who is the Lord of angels and archangels. This was my introduction to John Chrysostom. Um, and I have loved him ever since. The way he spoke of a Christian dying and passing away um, is something that has stayed in my brain ever since. And it's something that I've um, it, it's affected me so much that I live in light of this. We are all ambassadors. We live in a foreign kingdom. We live in a strange home, but we don't belong to this home anymore. As Christians, our citizenship, as Paul said, is in heaven. And so when our work as ambassadors for the King of Kings is done, we get called home, our true home. And putting it in that perspective, those believers that I know who I have loved dearly, whether dad or mom, whether friend or acquaintance, teacher or student, I realize their job as ambassador here was done. And we're all ambassadors. And that's one reason we're studying the apologists to learn how they defended and how they proclaimed the faith. So this week we're looking at John Chrysostom. And he's at the top of my Nicene and post Nicene early church history. And you can see he's between 370, where he was born, and passed away between 440 and 450. Um, 
looking at who are his contemporaries, some people we haven't looked at yet, um, Gregory of Nazanios, Gregory of Nisa, Basil the Great. Uh, we looked at Cyril. Uh, we looked at um, Epiphanius last week, Ambrose, Jerome, and we haven't yet looked at Augustine. But those are his contemporaries. He is Eastern. He is in Constantinople. That was the city he ended up moving to and becoming bishop in Constantinople. And we know Constantinople ends up hugely important when the emperor converts to Christianity, changes the name to Constantinople because his name is Constantine. Um, and Constantinople is the last city that had a Roman emperor into the 13th century when finally the Muslims uh, defeated the city of Constantinople and took it over and now it is Istanbul, Turkey. But this is where in the world we're gonna be. We're also gonna be a little bit in Antioch today. Okay, so who is John Chrysostom? Always good to know who he is because the who tends to explain the why and the how of how he thinks, how he works, how he serves, how he operates. So he's born in 347 in Antioch of pagan parents. They give him a classical Greek education. What does that mean? Uh, classical Greek is not the Greek the Bible was written in. Classical Greek or Attic Greek comes prior to the Bible, but all the ancient philosophical Greek writings are in Attic Greek. So he learned Attic Greek, though I'm sure he was talking and speaking some form of Koine. He meets up with Bishop Miletus, and we've met him in Pasha and his defense of the resurrection. Anyway, so you can start seeing how all these men of faith begin to interact and how they begin to get connected. Chrysostom, we'll call him that, is converted in speaking with Bishop Miletus. So he changes his study of the classical Greek and all the books there, the philosophies and everything. And he decides and he tells his parents, I am going to be studying religious works and the scripture. And he begins to study the Jewish scriptures and the Greek scriptures. That'd be the Old Testament and the New. Three years after his catechism, he is baptized as a believer and permitted to come to the Lord's table. Um, and three-year catechism back then was not an odd thing for adult converts. Um, as we later see, both baptism and the Lord's Supper are seen as sacraments. They are ways God does uh, give the gifts and distribute the gifts of salvation. As an adult convert, though, you did go through three years and no less of catechism, and then you were baptized. So once he's baptized, he decides he's going to set out to the desert. Um, at this point, St. Anthony, who Athanasius, that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, had learned from and spoken to and wrote about. He's in Egypt and Chrysostom is going to go to Egypt and he wants to live the life of an ascetic, a hermit. And simply what the hermits did was spend a lot of time praying, a lot of time in contemplation, and a lot of time serving others. Um, the beginning of the ascetic movement 
uh, while it might have been off with they wanted to separate from the world, in actuality, they served those around them, whether Christians or not, um, much better than later on as that developed into being a monk. Um, anyway, he was of poor health. So a lot of fasting and prayer, it really didn't do him really well. And so he's got to go home because he can't live such a strict life. So he goes home. So in 381, while he's in Antioch, Bishop Miletus ordains him as a deacon since he's finished his studies and everything. And he begins then studying for the next step, which is a priest or a presbyter, a pastor. And Miletus sends him to the cathedral in Antioch. And yes, by this point in church history, there are full-blown church buildings. And in actuality, they started back in the hundreds AD with the basilicas. So when you see that um, a church is called Basilica of such and such, it simply means it was built in the Roman style of a basilica, which was a square place, very open, had a place to speak, had places to sit. And most people just kind of stood there and listened to the speaker or the orator. In Christianity, the Christian basilicas were built the same way. But Chrysostom is asked to serve at the Cathedral of Antioch. And by this point, Rome has converted to Christianity and he's fairly free to preach as he wants. And he does. He um, is absolutely loved by the people he serves. So much so that we have the largest library of texts from his sermons. So I went to my old library in my house and I pulled up some of the volumes written by Chrysostom. So I have here the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. This one is volume 10. This entire thing, let me get Jeremy in here. Okay. The entire book, and it's not written large. This is all his sermons on Matthew. That's volume 10. Volume 9 is on the priesthood, being a pastor, ascetic treatises, homilies, and letters, and also his apologetic against statues and the idols of Greece and Rome. And again, pretty thick. And then volume 13, these are on his sermons on Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, both books of Thessalonians and Timothy, Titus and Philemon. And again, not very large print, but it's all on the scriptures and it's his sermons, both as presbyter and later as bishop. And so in 386, Bishop Flavian ordains him as presbyter or priest. But then in September 397, the Bishop of Constantinople suddenly died. He's in Antioch. So the other bishops from the other churches decide that they're gonna go and basically kidnap him, bring him to Constantinople and force him to be the Bishop of the church there. He does not want it. He likes being parish priest. He likes being pastor for the flock, the small flock. Well, 
that was the first bit of intrigue that he finds. And what happened was they thought they could get him to do things they wanted done. We talked just before I hit record about the power of politics and power of ecclesiastical leadership can corrupt, and it did. Constantinople was a mess. Here they were, capital city of the empire, capital city of Christianity in the East, and they were a mess. He brings priests to trial because they were asking for money for their prayers. They were asked, simony, basically. They were stealing from the flock. Money that came in for the poor, they put in their own bank accounts for their children. They would buy land with money that was meant for food for the poor. So he goes and he's gonna clean up the church in Constantinople. Most people don't like cleanup. I mean, they'd rather stay in their sins. Oh, you're exposing it? This is what he did. And they did not like it or appreciate it. In one sermon, when the emperor had died, his, his wife took over. She was now empress. And she decided she was going to have a beautiful silver statue of herself built and placed pretty much in front of the church. His first sermon after that thing went up was about Jezebel and how Jezebel led the people to idol worship. Well, the priests and presbyters around who heard his sermon quickly ran to the empress and told her all about it. And she threw him into exile. But that didn't last long. The very next day she freed him because the bishops in Rome and Antioch and Carthage were up in arms. That the political power thought they had any right to do what they wanted with ecclesiastical leaders. So she quickly, realizing her control over the empire would be disrupted, she quickly released him. Anyway, he went back to Constantinople to continue cleanup, and he confronted everybody. He had two different ways of talking with people. With those in the church, he had no use for them if they were corrupt. And he said so in not so nice terms. To the people in the pew, to the sheep under his care, he was gentle and kind, loving, compassionate, giving to the point that he gave up even the pay he was receiving as bishop, you know, to live, to buy food, to clothing and stuff like that. Anyway, um, he ended up, exiled again because they didn't like he was cleaning up the church and then in 407 he was released from a third exile and they forced him to travel in the winter back to Constantinople and he died on the way the emperor one generation later collected uh, his bones basically and brought them back to Constantinople to rest under the church that he was bishop of. So that's who Chrysostom is. I found this interesting, and I'm going to move this thing so I can read it, because I just kind of thought, wow, this is really apropos for today. Should we look to kings and princes to put right the inequalities between rich and poor? Should we require soldiers to come and seize the rich person's gold and distribute it among his destitute neighbors? Should we beg the emperor to impose a tax on the rich so great that it reduces them to the level of the poor and then to share the proceeds of that tax among everyone? Equality imposed by force would achieve nothing and do much harm. 
Those who combined both cruel hearts and sharp minds would soon find ways of making themselves rich again. Worse still, the rich whose gold was taken away would feel bitter and resentful, while the poor who received the gold form uh, from the hands of soldiers would feel no gratitude they, because no generosity would have prompted the gift. Far from bringing moral benefit to society, it would actually do moral harm. Material justice cannot be accomplished by compulsion of change of heart will not follow. The only way to achieve true justice is to change people's hearts first, and then they will joyfully share their wealth. And I thought that's kind of appropriate today with everything going on, social justice and everything. And you know what? Forcing people to be right and to do right and to be just and to do just, that's not ever going to work. We've got to give them the message that changes their hearts, and then they'll change. Okay, Chrysostom, that's actually not his name. <laughs> we know him as John of Antioch. Well, that's how he was known back then, Bishop of Constantinople. In the sixth century, he is given the name Chrysostom, which means gold mouthed. So it was due to his eloquence and that he was loved by those whom he pastored over. And so they called him the gold mouth preacher. It is said, and I may agree, he was the most beautiful pastor and sermon writer in the church ever past the apostles. I, 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 I favor Chrysostom in that way because I found in his writings, his letters, his epistles, and his apologies to be eloquent and yet easy to understand and simple to digest. His words are, they flow, they're sharp at times, they're powerful, and at other times they're gentle and tender. And I would agree, definitely gold mouthed. Okay, so that's him as deacon, pastor, preacher, preacher bishop, lover of God and lover of God's people. But he wrote two very different apologetic books. One is polemic, one is irenic. Anyone remember the difference? One is preaching the gospel to unbelievers, and the other one is to believers. Correct. Correct. Um, which is which? Polemic is to unbelievers. Yes. I, I, if you have trouble remembering, I always do this way. Irenic starts with an I. Inside the church. Inside belongs with, starts with an I. Polemic, poles. Polar, opposites. Opposites are not the same. So polemic is those who are not among us. They're not the same. They're not Christians. That's how my brain worked years ago, trying to remember the two. Anywho, okay. So his two apologetics is um, one, the demonstration about against the pagans that Christ is God. Watch his pattern. He begins by opening up the Old Testament scriptures to prove Christ is coming, his first coming. Then he goes to the Gospels and proves that he was both God and man. Then he goes to the book of Acts and he shows that the mission of the apostles is fulfilling what was foretold in the Old Testament texts. He shows again how the Old Testament 
showed the rejection of the Jews against Jesus oops, in the New Testament. He then shows from the New Testament that the cross is a sign of glory, not that a criminal was nailed there, but God himself. Uh, and that the cross itself is the foundation of many blessings. Then he continues that Christ is the one who will come again to judge everyone. He then explains in his work how fast the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire and beyond into the Persian Empire, into the Indio Empire. He shows how the miracles that the apostles did were done through Christ, not their own selves. Talks about the persecution of Christians and how they willingly went to the arenas because they knew they had a better home. Talks about the temple destruction in 70 AD and how that was foretold by Christ. And he also shows that the recent attempts at rebuilding the temple, which if you ever wanna do a research study, there were three re-attempts at rebuilding the temple long before Israel was created as a nation in the 1940s, and each one was destroyed either by lightning, fire, or earthquake. And so they finally gave up trying to rebuild the temple. Anyway, this is his polemic. This is his reasoning to the Greek philosophers, the Roman teachers, why their pagan religion is nothing compared to that of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And it's a hard to get book. Um, I Mine is actually on order because I was able to put parts together, but a full copy is on order from Amazon and I kind of have to wait another week or so before it gets here. It is a difficult book to find. It is a difficult, but thankfully it has both of these apologetic books in it. Um, and it's done by a patristic company. So the second one is a discourse on blessed Biblius and against the Greeks. You almost think this might be polemic, but it's not. Biblius was a Christian and he displayed what Chrysostom called apostolic boldness. He told the emperor, the one before Constantine, who wasn't a Christian, pretty much the gospel. And he got pulled away and he was executed. And so this is a letter to the Christians about how to show Christianity is superior to paganism. It's kind of like an apologetic textbook. In there, he has an entire section on quotes from the Old Testament that we should learn in order to prove Christianity true. That section alone is about 25 pages long hundreds of verses from the Old Testament. Then he goes into a little bit about the Apollos worship and so forth and so on. And also because Emperor Julian would do nothing to help the Christians, they're kind of wondering, well, wait a minute, why isn't God mad at that emperor? So he deals with the delay of justice on the crooked emperors, the pagan emperors. So he deals a little bit with what we would call the philosophical issue of the problem of pain. And he deals with it from the perspective of, yes, we live in a world of suffering. One day that will end, but not 
today. And so he explains how the Christians should live in that time of delayed justice. So his discourse on Biblius is written for Christians, an encouragement to them living in a world that hates Christians. And it is a great early, I would call it apologetic textbook. So, okay. Here are some quotes from him. And um, these are just great. God has given himself entirely to you and without reserve. If he has given you all and nothing more remains for him to give you, as indeed he has done in his passion and in the Holy Eucharist, reason requires that you also should give yourself without reserve to him. Some things to think about. The other one, um, if we approach with faith, we too will see Jesus. For the Eucharistic table takes the place of the crib. Here, the body of the Lord is present, wrapped not in swaddling clothes, but in the rays of the Holy Spirit. And that was from his sermon on Matthew. Let's go next. Okay. Another one. Uh, by the cross, we know the gravity of sin and the greatness of God's love toward us. And then Christians are not to destroy error by force. We should work the salvation of men by persuasion, instruction, and love. And on this quote, I'm asking, why do we do apologetics? We answer for the faith. We give a response for what we believe to unbelievers, to those actually asking serious questions about the faith, and even to other Christians. Now, why would I do apologetics with other Christians? Well, because other Christians are still struggling with doubt and fear and unbelief. Mm -hmm. And it teaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other reasons? How about correcting them? You know, giving that little nudge. You don't want to go down that road. That leads to bad heresy. Come back on over to the to the truth, you know, a little bit of correction is done in apologetics. We defend the faith, one, why? One, because we are often attacked for our faith. So we put up a defense using words, nothing else. We defend it against error and we defend it to all who are saying Christianity is false. Christianity is not true. Christianity is the panacea of mankind, you know? No, it's not. Christianity is hard. Christianity is, is um, very different than every other religion. And so this is why we do it. And when we are defending the faith, we have to remember, one, who we're talking to. Are they someone truly asking about the Christian faith? Or two, are they just trying to pick an argument? They just want to debate. You know what I do with those? Bye. I'm not here to debate. I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to just answer your questions of curiosity. If you want to really talk, I'm here to answer those questions. But if you're just here because you're speculating and you're really not interested, 
I'm going to go to the person who's really wanting to know. So let me ask you this. Why are we even looking at all these old guys that did apologetics 16, 17, 1800 years ago? Question one. And question two, what have you learned so far from them? I would say we um, are studying these old folks because human nature doesn't change. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. I do find it interesting that um, <clears throat> even at Strasbourg, we started really talking about the decline of Christianity in the era of Hume, if I got his name right, and yeah. you know the 17 and 1800s, and that well, we didn't need apologetics before then because everyone was just going along fine. Then all of a sudden, you know, philosophy came in and started decline. It just, it just what she said, every nothing new under the sun. You know, when I was a kid, I thought that all evil started in the 60s. That ever for we had three. Obviously, the Bible was the otherwise. We had three thousand years of you know, 1950s, the Donna Reed show or whatever. And then all of a sudden the sixties came and it was, uh, it took me a while to put together what scripture said with reality. And that is, is that man has always struggled this way. And yeah. I'm seeing the struggles they're going through. Like you say, every, nothing new under the sun, the same heresies and everything keep, have to keep beaten down over and over and over. Yep. Absolutely. Dan. So I'll, I'll answer the part about what have I, what have we I have learned so far. I think the emphasis on um, not so much about your own experience and the part start with Jesus and end with Jesus in your talks. Mm -hmm. I I mm -hmm. uh, posted. Forgive me. It was either last night or this morning that if your apologetic doesn't begin with the gospel. And then your apologetic doesn't end with the gospel. And by that, I mean telling the gospel. Jesus died for, your, for our sins. Jesus rose again for our sins. If it doesn't begin there and it doesn't end there, you haven't done apologetics right. Because if we're not presenting the gospel, now that could be simply somebody has observed your life. Wow. Donna, you live differently. Why aren't you so worried about this stuff? Or Kathy, you're so exceptionally kind. Why? To me, that's living the new life. And that should sometimes spark conversations. So by that, I mean, you're, that's what can trigger a conversation, how the gospel has changed you. But then you do the defense in the middle, right? You answer the questions, try to stay on track and don't end up down various rabbit holes, um, which if you know me can happen in a moment. Um, and then you wrap it up with, hey, I'm just going to pick a name out of the hat. Hey, Melissa, this is what Jesus has done for us. This is what Jesus has done for me. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. He loves you unconditionally. And he rose again to prove your sins are taken care of. Come with me to church so you can hear more. That, to me, wraps up an apologetic conversation. These men we've studied all did that in some way, shape, or form. They did it to the best that they could. Some of them, it cost their lives. Some of them, it cost their reputation. Some of them, it cost their family. And we have to realize that there is a cost. And we may not, it may not be big, a big cost for us. But nevertheless, it is not easy. 
as a Christian in a world that hates Christians. Well, let me go back to what made me love Chrysostom is that this world's not my home. Mm-hmm. It's a small a small H home. My home's in heaven. That's where the kingdom is in its fullness. I know we live in the kingdom here and we're citizens of that kingdom, but we live in a kingdom within a really crazy, crazy sick kingdom, (laughs) if you get what I mean. So one day I get to go home when my job is done here. In apologetics, that's when we are the best ambassadors because we're giving the king's message, the gospel, we're living in another kingdom as if we don't really belong to that kingdom, but we get familiar with its culture and its way of speaking and stuff. But in reality, we want those in that kingdom to come join God's kingdom. So anyone else with what they've learned from these old guys and how has it yet equipped you to answer questions? I, I thought it was interesting that that so many of these have uh, been going on in in the three to four hundreds, so so close to when the apostles were. Um, you know, you, instead of you think we think of the Reformation often in the fifteen hundreds, but um, um, to me that. That gives them a lot, a lot more perspective on what the church was talking about and what the apostles were saying right at the time um, after the after it occurred. Mm-hmm. Kathy, you had waved as well. Yeah, I was going to say that um, what I've learned is is how, especially with Epiphanius, how the heresies that are embedded in the Christian church these days in certain places are not new there. They've, they were dealing with it back, you know, in the, in the hundreds and that I, I hadn't stopped to think about Uh, as for helping me with answers. um, It's, it's getting there, (laughs) but I still need to go back and, and go through it again and again to kind of, uh, work it all all out but it's a good start you know don't um, worry about that i've been studying this since 20 2005 i still go keep going back that gives me hope just a little comment about well, what you said about your life and and that it may open a conversation um uh, when uh, 9-11 happened I was working at McKinsey and Company in, in um, Toronto, and um, um, after about a week or two, uh, oh, and my husband's boss was killed. In he was uh, visiting in the one tower, and the planes came in right at that level, and he was instantly killed. And um, and I had told my fellow workers about that, and um, they several noticed how calm I was about all of this. All of them were so fearful now that terror was in our lives and that something horrible was going to happen because there was also a, a plan in, um, in uh, Toronto for a plane to go through some of the towers in Toronto and that got thwarted before it could happen. So that they were just in, in constant fear. And so then they asked me why I was so calm. And I said, I, uh, you know, wasn't I affected by it? And I go, absolutely, I was affected by it. But, but I know that if I die, I know where I'm going. I know that Jesus has saved me. And so I don't need to worry whether I live or whether I die. And, and what is 20 years ago, I was, I guess, just 40. And, and I'm like, I'd like to live a whole lot longer. But, um, you know, but if I go, I'm ready and I know where I'm going. And that just 
totally rattled their brains. And uh, of the about, I think it was five or six people that had asked me that originally, there was two that started talking to me more regularly after that, three actually, um, after that, trying to get answers to their questions about faith. So that opened up those doors. And I was very pleased to be able to serve, you know, uh, God in that way. Yeah. And there's so many other ways that service and, you know, I, I personally um, grew up with the best way to tell the gospel is stand on the street corner and just keep yelling it and eventually people hear. When I became Lutheran, I learned a really weird way of doing that. Love my neighbor. Love, what do you mean love my neighbor? I need words. Well, yeah, but you love your neighbor to create the relationship where they begin asking. Yeah. And then you use your words. I'm not going to go with the, oh, I forget his name. Um, he's the saint, Francis. He got rid of all books and dictionaries and words. And he said, you should just proclaim your gospel by your life. Well, you can't do that because at some point you actually have to speak the gospel because God says that it's the power of God to salvation and they have to hear the gospel in Romans 10, 14, I think, where hearing by the word of God brings faith. I know I just botched that whole verse, but that's the generic meaning of that, that you've got to speak the gospel. But often it's by our life that they're looking. What may, why are you different? Why don't, what, yeah. and you don't sound like a kook either. Um, <laughs> you know, the hellfire brimstone kook. It's because you love God and so you love your neighbor. And then conversations open up. The first three years we were here, I tried constantly the old evangelical way of telling my neighbors about Jesus. Then became Lutheran. I had to relearn a lot when I became Lutheran. And so I paid attention. I'd ask questions, but I paid attention. And I watched my new friends at Faith Lutheran. And I watched that they loved, like really loved in action. And that's how people began asking things. I thought, well, this is really different. And so the best way I know now is loving God by loving my neighbor, serving them, helping them, and praying the whole time for God to open that door where I can now answer their question about the Christian faith. Go ahead, Dorothy. Um, we had an apologetics class at church and uh, most of it was way not helpful, but uh, our pastor, uh, assistant pastor did say that uh, the questions become repetitive and you get easier, like riding a bicycle, you know. <laughs> So that's been a year experience too. There's categories or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the questions are similar from unbelievers. And so you can have your stockpile of answers in the back well, of your head. That's not really, I don't guess that's not what I, he didn't have a difference between a believer and non, just, um, questions about Christianity in general get to be the similar to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that too. Yeah, I could see that too. And as you practice, I hate to say practice, but as you engage, see, I won't ever say it's easier 
my knees still knock, my heart still wants to jump right out of my chest. When I'm talking with an unbeliever, I get all sweaty. I, I get nervous. That doesn't change because for me, we are now on the cusp of an eternal issue. It, that makes me super, super nervous. And while I don't want to unnecessarily offend them, I know the gospel is an offense. So it's going to offend at some point. So the nervousness, the, the that probably won't ever go away. Forgetting the answer probably won't ever go away. <laughs> um, and the missed opportunity will never go away. How many times you realize, oh, there was an opportunity there and God, I missed it. Good thing the Holy Spirit doesn't because he can still work and bring that person to another person who can share whatever you thought you were going to. And then maybe that he helps you keep that in mind. So you're a little more alert and aware the next time. But in my experience, um, yeah, missed, missed opportunity and the nervousness about that or the heaviness, like, oh, I missed that opportunity. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God, God's working on you too. So you know. Um, okay. It's almost three o'clock. So any other questions, comments? Nope. Okay. Next week, we are going to go a little bit backwards, not too far, eh, about a decade or two. And we're going to look at what is known as the Cap Cappadocian fathers. These are three men and there's one lady in the mix too. Um, but the, these three men helped with understanding the triune God and helped to formulate what we now recognize as Trinitarian doctrine. We'll get a little bit of a repeat of Athanasius speckled in there, but I really want to look at these three men. And if I can pop my screen back up, because here they are. This guy, these. St. Gregory the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and Basil the Great. And um, so we're going to look at those three gentlemen. You can research them online and get familiar with them. You're going to find a couple of ladies, uh, sisters, and literal sisters, um, and other people entwined with those three. But those three are known as the Cappadocian fathers. So um, someone had asked me uh, in the Apologetics Facebook group, if I was gonna get there. And so, yes, we're getting there next week. And then we'll have one more week and then I'll be book touring presenting in Texas. So um, that's where we're going next week. So if there's nothing else, then we're done. Ended up two minutes early, that's good for me. Um, and I hope to see all of you next week. So have a great week. Be blessed. And thanks for coming again. Thank you. Thank you.